Today, um, I'm going to do a little bit of logistics and a little bit of inner practice. So it'll kind of go back and forth like last week between just some kind of uh, tick list, interesting ideas, brainstorming, things that uh, might not have too much emotional content and are more just kind of getting organized. And then also some things that have a bit more um, emotional content to them and practice elements to them. And for the whole course, Remember that everything that you do in order to prepare for your own death, it will help you in preparing for the deaths of others. And anything you do to prepare for the deaths of others is gonna help you prepare for your own death. But that marriage is going to work a lot better if you do it intentionally. So if you consciously think anything I learned today, may it work for my own death, may it help inform the way I support others through theirs and just really connect those two. I made you um, a little PowerPoint and I won't use it too much the whole time, but we'll go back and forth. And um, your course materials this time were mostly things to help people in the Bardo, as well as kind of some interesting options to use during funerals. And I tried to do a mixture of things that would work from a secular perspective, as well as things that are more traditionally Buddhist. So um, in the break time, if you want to kind of have a read through of those in case you have any questions. But for now, we'll just begin. This is just first things first. So first things first is the needs of the dying from a Buddhist perspective. So these are things to adapt to whoever it is that's dying, whether it's yourself or others. Whether they have a connection with Buddhism or not, these are really important considerations. So don't worry if you can't read the screen, I'll read it out to you. But basically, what we need to remember is that the main thing is to keep the room quiet and calm. Yeah, just keep coming back to if I get lost in all sorts of details and ideas, it's so important to keep the room quiet and calm. So we're remembering that this process is not about you, the carer, friend, or family member. It's about the dying person and their process. So <clears throat> it's helpful if support people to the dying person manage their grief and their other emotions with people outside the situation or at least in a different location to where the death is occurring. What this really means is when you're in the room with someone dying, you remember that they're particularly sensitive. They might not um, hear all the specific words that you say. They might kind of be in and out of consciousness. They might be semi-comatose, but energetically, they're very sensitive, especially to big energy. So it's not like you're not allowed to be sad. Yeah, and it's not like you're not allowed to have big family dramas or conflicts. Those things are gonna happen. You can't kind of organize around huge emotions. They're just gonna happen sometimes. But if you can remember, try and keep it out of the room, try and keep it away from the person that's dying, especially in those final stages. If they're still lucid, if they're still able to speak, it might be that it's helpful to talk to them about, I'm gonna miss you so much, I love you so much, thank you for the things that we've shared. I'm gonna be okay, but I will absolutely miss you. Those conversations are totally appropriate and wonderful to have with folks when they're in transition and still able to speak. But once they go into that kind of semi-conscious, comatose kind of near-death place, um, it, maybe it's like as if they're sleeping all the time, or um, their sleep is really in and out and they kind of are fading in and out. Once they get to that stage, really try not to bring your baggage into the room with you. You know, really make it about them. Does that make sense, right? You're trying to create this atmosphere that's really gonna allow for the best to come out of them. And it's a little bit as if they're going back to how they were as a baby. You know, with babies, you can't explain all the details of what's going on and can't say, don't worry, we're mad, but we're not mad at you. Or don't worry, we're scared, but it's going to pass. You know, babies don't understand content in terms of words, but they definitely understand the energy. You know, they really respond to when there's tension in the air, or they really respond to when there's some sort of big emotion in the air. So kind of imagine the dying person a bit like an infant. 
yeah. Um, so keep it peaceful, keep it calm. That's the main thing, okay? And then um, this includes a little bit of tricky advocacy work. So this includes asking your emotional friends and family members to work out their strong emotions in a way that doesn't disturb the dying person. Ideally, any like hysterical crying or anger to happen out of sight. So this can be tricky. This can be something that um, brings up a lot for people because how do you talk to someone about navigating their strong emotions in a skillful way that is honoring their grief and honoring their process, but kind of is still reminding them that actually this is their death, <laughs> it's not your death. And so let's try and be there for their death. So far, familiar or logical, yeah. Easier said than done, but if it's in the forefront of your mind, it's a lot easier to come into the room oriented that way. Yeah. When it's you that's dying, I think it's, it's completely reasonable to say, I love you all, piss off, <laughs> right? Um, you're wonderful, here's all the ways that I love you, all the ways that I appreciate you. Here are various letters and messages of my love for you. Now get out, I need to do my practice especially if you can do that earlier, you know, before you're actively dying, when you're still in, like now, to say, just so you know, when I'm dying, I'm a Buddhist. Um, this is an exciting adventure for me. This is an opportunity to realize something significant. So when I'm actually dying, if you guys could give me space, that would be a huge gift to me. And please don't feel neglected. Please don't feel like I'm you know, distancing myself from you in a negative way. Just hear that I'm going to be withdrawing inward anyway, and I want to use that process rather than being distracted by the outside world, because I'm going to have to leave it anyway. You know, so if you can have those conversations with your friends and family before it's crunch time, you know, before your cancer diagnosis, before you hit 80, before this, before that, if you can have it conversationally when everybody's healthy-ish, it means that when you then revisit that conversation, it's not going to be so triggering. They'll have had some time to sit with it. Okay, so with all of this, there's like the best case scenario, and then there's what might actually happen. And what might actually happen is that everyone's full of chaos and nobody is organized and people are just a bundle of emotions and that's what's happening. So if in the back of your mind you have, let's plan for the best, but expect the worst, <laughs> right? Um, you know, here's what the best case scenario would be. And I know life is not usually that tidy and organized. So the main thing is that I work on my own internal processes. So if I'm going into the room of someone dying, I'm bringing peace with me. I'm bringing an invitation for peace with me. I'm you know, having some sort of radiating effect that's useful to everyone there. And if I'm the dying person and people are freaking out, that I have enough familiarity with my practice that I can click back into it, even if they're doing distracting things. Yeah. So just coming back to some of those uh, right before death logistics. Um, if you're in the caring position, helping the dying person connect to their spiritual refuge by reminding them of the prayers, practices, songs, meditations, and teachings that they love. Surrounding them with the images that remind them of their practice. So what this really means is now is not the time to force your agenda on people. If they're Christian and they've always been Christian, don't bring in pictures of Tara, bring in pictures of Mary, right? It's same, same, right? You know that at the end of the day, what we're trying to connect with is conditions that bring out loving kindness and compassion. Don't kind of jolt them into your worldview. It's not going to work. Um, they might be accepting and agreeable just because they want you to be happy, but it's actually a bit kind of distressing and disturbing for them to try and think about a whole brand new worldview at the last minute. So that said, of course, we do want them to have imprints for something that is a Buddhist related practice. So perhaps they can have a connection with, with a spiritual path that leads all the way to enlightenment. But we want to do that in a really considerate way, in a really... Um, 
invitational way as opposed to an opposing, imposing type of way. And so what you might do is say, you know, granddad, mom, whoever it is, would you like it if I sang to you? And I have some, some Buddhist mantras that I love. I could sing those, or I could sing some Simon and Garfunkel if you prefer, but you know, just kind of like give them some options and let them pick. You know, here's, here's some stories that are fun. I have some Buddhist stories, you know, you could tell the Asanga Maitreya cave story. You could tell, um, you know, Aesop's fables. You could tell them, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, but, you know, really try and lean into what does it seem like they're receptive to? Because the main point is trying to move them into and click them into their refuge. And for especially, I think, Australians, their refuge might not be that clear. You know, they might have sort of been nominally Christian when they were young and then kind of left it and never replaced it with anything. And so they've got some, you know, kind of whispers of Christianity and some kind of new age sprinkle. And then they've got some like love of nature and it's all a big kind of conglomeration of things that make me remember meaning and purpose are. You know, and so, so try and think about what do they love? Um, like I mentioned last time, with my grandfather when he was dying, we knew that he loved nature. We knew that he loved nature. And we also knew that he was a Mason, right? And I didn't know much about the Masons and it sounded like some sort of weird kind of semi-culty something Christian, I didn't really get it. And then I did some research and I read some of their prayers and they're like totally lovely prayers about you know brotherly love and civic responsibility. And it turned out Masons are super cool. Um, and so I read, um, and I had my father read some of the Mason prayers to him. And, you know, it was things that I knew that he loved because he'd kept those prayer books with him every move, you know, every move closer and closer to the nursing home. He had gotten rid of more and more things, but that he had kept with him the whole time. So I could guess that was significant to him, even though he'd never talked about it with me. So if you're just thinking about your loved ones, it might be that they've never articulated to you what their spiritual path is or what their place of refuge is, but you do still kind of know. You, know, you just kind of think really deeply, what have they always come back to? Are there certain artists or songwriters or poets that they seem to always derive some comfort from? Are there stories they read to you when you were young? You know, things like that. Um, that can help reconnect them with their refuge. So refuge is important, even if it's not a Buddhist refuge. So if there's ways that you can link them back to that, it's gonna be really useful. The difficulty is the tendency to use people as refuge. Yeah, that's the danger land. If someone's whole life, they haven't had a spiritual path in particular, they're gonna rely on human beings and human beings are not a valid source of refuge, are they? Um, and also it's gonna make it harder for them to let go at the time of death. So one thing that Lama Zopa Rinpoche said um, at a teaching at Amitabha Hospice some years ago, um, I asked him, what do you say to people who aren't Buddhist, but you wanna help them have a positive rebirth? And what he said was, help them rejoice. Help them rejoice, but help them also rejoice in the fact that you will be okay without them. So first you're helping them rejoice in their life and uh, the way in which they've led a very positive life. But then you want to also tell them of things that you're looking forward to, things you have in your life, and the way in which you're going to be okay without them. You have to do it skillfully so they don't feel like their life didn't matter and you never needed them anyway, right? You have to do it delicately. But to really, um, what are ways to put their mind at ease? Yeah, rejoicing in their own life, rejoicing in the fact that life will continue even when they're not in that body. The lessons that they've passed on will continue. Their various legacies will continue anything you can do to remind them that their life had meaning and purpose and that that meaning and purpose will continue even after they leave that body. So that's particularly useful if you're with someone who's an atheist. Yeah, as to say, these lessons that you taught our family are lessons that we will carry on. 
you know, because that's the kind of legacy that's going to have meaning for them. How are you going so far? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Something. What if someone's had a really led quite a negative life? Like they've created a lot of negative situations for themselves and others in meaning, or they might sort of really hate you to say something like that if they really, you know, they've had enough. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're thinking about like if someone has led a really negative life and they're aware of that and feeling guilt about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it's hard to bring up things that wouldn't be difficult for them. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, you know, and it's important that you, that even occurs to you. You know, that's because you know that person to person, you're going to have to tweak the conversation so that it suits that person. Mm -hmm. And in the case of someone who's really consumed with a lot of regret and guilt, that forgiveness process um, that was in your course materials last week, that's something that you can use for yourself and write yourself, or it's something you can lead someone else through. And leading someone through a forgiveness process doesn't mean that whoever they hurt has to be there or accept it. It's a process of kind of owning your own responsibility and giving other people their responsibility and then de-identifying from negative states of mind. Because all of our choices came about in a context, didn't they? We didn't do any damaging thing all on our own. So many causes and conditions supported the choice. So even though we're responsible for the choice and we're the one who's experiencing the seed ripening down the path, still it's not us alone who did it. So if you can kind of help them, I don't know, some kind of letting go process where you're reminding them that their mistakes are not independent. Yeah, are not identity traits, are not them. But again, that's only if they have enough lucidity to have a conversation if they're no longer lucid and you know that before when they were talking, it sounded like they were really full of regret. Um, in that case, it's a better idea to navigate around that and go more into like body relaxation. Yeah, and there's some body relaxation techniques in your um, course materials. But basically what you wanna do is shift their focus from the negative to the positive. Yeah, and so if they can't go to the positive, bring them to neutral. And the easiest way to kind of bring someone to neutral is to do some sort of body awareness because the body lives in the present. And so if they can kind of go through the different parts of the body and relax them one by one, if they can bring some light to those different parts of the body and just kind of feel like their system is being flushed clean that they're getting some sort of clean slate for their next life and that all the trauma and all of the pain and all of the mistakes of this life don't have to be things that they carry with them to the next life. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think you're, you know, spot on to recognize this is not going to work for everyone talking about rejoicing. The word rejoicing itself is a little bit cheesy, right? It's kind of an American like, oh, I'm rejoicing. Yay. You know, it's kind of corny. Um, so I wouldn't even use that word, but you know the practice of rejoicing in Buddhism, but what you actually say are more an invitation to remember this. Yeah, let's remember this. And you know, it's a wonderful thing worth rejoicing in, but you're just kind of like going down memory lane with them. Or you're reminding them of things that you shared together, you know, funny stories, but at the core of it was something really kind that they did. And you're not saying, look at this kind thing that you did. You're talking about the story that had that kindness in it. You know, so it's kind of, it's being really skillful to the moment and not thinking that every death is going to be the same, that every person is going to be the same, but that the, the overriding thing that you want to create is a peaceful atmosphere. So what is the way for this person in front of me to access that? Now, does that help? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Listen, I'm very worried about my parents because they're both actually completely dependent. I mean, they've been together for nearly 60 or 70 years, either completely loving each other or hating each other, um, and irritable with anything and everything else in life. So the death process with them, especially for their children, is going to be a really difficult experience just because of the way it's even set up at the moment. The dynamics are so difficult right now. Um, is there anything to offer about people who are angry at the time of death? 
again, to remember the child mind a little bit that as people get closer and closer to death, there is aspects of them that become more childlike, especially if they have a tiny bit of dementia or they have fully fledged dementia. And so whether you think of them a bit like a child or a bit like a drunk person, there are certain things you just don't argue with children about and you just don't argue with drunk people about because they don't have the space to hear logic. You know, so you have to kind of gauge it of similarly to what we were talking about before of what's going to soothe their mind. And so can you lead them both in a visualization that's relaxing? Can you lead them both in a song that they both love? So rather than confront the angry dynamic, if they don't have the mental space for it, what's a way to shift gears to something that you know brings out some sort of joy or life in them? You know, it could be food, <laughs> food, music, you know, kind of worldly things, maybe even attachment things. But, you know, it's easier to move attachment into love than it is to move anger into love. So if you can at least shift them from anger to attachment, then you're closer to getting them to something actually positive, if that makes sense. So, so to think in terms of circuit breakers, mm -hmm. rather than let's try and give them all of the long rim logic about why anger is never justified. It's like that ship has sailed. <laughs> we'll um, talk about that next life. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes people go into this really kind of contemplative, receptive, let's finally look at the big questions headspace. But I think that, you know, each time you visit someone who's near death to really see who are they today, because there's also a lot of changeability. It could be that they were really peaceful and receptive today, and then tomorrow they're gonna be grumpy and angry and forgetful and full of all their stuff. And it can happen very quickly that they shift so it's kind of like, who are they today? And they're like, and then you think, okay, they're like that one 30 years ago. I remember that one. <laughs> or, oh, they're more like how they were 10 years ago when they were kind of at the height of their understanding of life and the height of their connection with peace. And lately they've declined, but there was that kind of peak where they were starting to touch some insight and they're ready for me to speak to that place. So living in the present with someone who's dying is so hard because as soon as you've been with them one day you start creating the plan for the next time you'll see them and they're going to be a totally different person then you know they or they might be so to just really you know the general idea try to bring an atmosphere of peace and then let go of too much technicality and just try and really see who are they today Similarly with ourselves when we're dying, it could be that some days we can do a good sadhana practice and we can do all sorts of meditations and then we think, oh great, this is the meditation I'll do until I die. And then the next day you have total brain fog or your body hurts too much and you just can't. And just to let go a bit and come back to refuge, bodhicitta, peace, or at least peace, you know? So taking it day by day. Um, you know, another thing that I found helpful with a lot of folks who are dying is to reassure them that their animals will be looked after and that projects they care for will be looked after or things that they feel responsible for will be fine. So um, if you know that there's things, you know, like some guys are really obsessed with where are their tools going to go after they die or where is their china going to go after they die or their babies, you know, whatever, their fur babies. I, I think it's really useful to mention those things, even if they haven't mentioned those things. Mm -hmm. You know, so so-and-so the dog, um, you know, remember that so-and-so is going to look after them, and right now they're doing great, and here's a picture of them yesterday at the park. You know, things like that can help them, one, relax, and two, disengage, and not feel um, that kind of hanging on. Um, if you can, check the aspects of their funeral or life celebration has been discussed. Um, if it hasn't, you just do your best. But discussions and decisions about their remains as well can kind of put their mind at ease. Um, so find out what prayers and practices they want at death and if they're Buddhist for the 49 days after their death and get that organized and tell them that, whether they seem particularly lucid or not. Um, telling them sometimes can really put their mind at ease. So 
you know, different family members have a different ability to talk openly about death. And I think, you know, venerable children who works at Karuna Hospice, she always says, ask them, is it okay if we talk openly about death? You know, kind of just start with, is it okay if we talk openly about death? Or is it okay if we talk about your funeral? Because I want it to be something really beautiful that you would have been, would be happy with, you know? But just kind of ask permission. And often they'll be happy that you're bringing it up because they didn't know how to bring it up because it was too awkward or too painful. Occasionally they'll say, no, I don't want to talk about it. And, you know, be careful about not pushing but it could be then in a few days you say, um, so for your funeral, I was thinking to play this and this. I was thinking to show this in this picture. Is that okay? And they might say, I don't want to talk about it. Or they might say, no, don't use that picture. I hate that picture. Use this picture, you know, and then it'll kind of like open the conversation. 